Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome J Street's president, Jeremy Ben Ami. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is a very loud microphone. Welcome to J Street's 2016 National Assembly. It is great to have you here this evening. Uh, it's great to have so many exciting events that are going on this weekend. We have 250 J Street U students who are in town for their national town hall. We have hundreds of J Street big leaders who are here for our National Leadership Summit. We have a thousand people coming to dinner tomorrow night for our national gala with, with Vice President Joe Biden. And we have scores of meetings on Capitol Hill on Tuesday on our National Advocacy Day. Now, some of you may have heard uh, by now that our weekend got off to quite a start with the J Street U Board having the opportunity to meet in the Oval Office on Friday with President Barack Obama. I, I take that as a sign of the importance that the President assigns to the work we're doing and to the emerging young voices that are redefining what it means to be pro-Israel in the 21st century. What an exciting moment that was. While this is our biggest series of events in 2016, I know there's some disappointment that we're not having a full conference this year. So I want to make sure I draw to everyone's attention in your program that the dates for next year's full national conference are in the program. They have been set February 25th to 28th of 2017, and I hope to see you and several of your family and friends there as well. Our last conference drew over 3,000 people, and we hope that February 2017 will be even larger. And one month into a new administration, it should be a very timely event. Tonight's program concerning Israel, American Jewish politics, and the 2016 election couldn't be more timely either. Over the past few weeks, Israel and Jewish politics have been a visible and active part of the presidential campaign in both political parties. On the Republican side, we've had controversies over whether or not it is pro-Israel to call for being a neutral broker, trying to actually strike a two-state deal, or whether it is only pro-Israel to call for taking unapologetically Israel's side at every turn. On the Democratic side, this past Thursday's debate provided perhaps the most serious and certainly visible discussion of Middle East policy in a presidential campaign that has ever happened. Both Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton openly addressed the need for a two-state solution and debated the best path forward to assure the security of Israel and the rights of the Palestinian people. The question of just what it means for the United States to be pro-Israel is squarely on the table and being openly and frankly debated on national television. That's an incredible shift, and everyone involved in J Street should be proud of the role we have helped to bring about this change in American politics. The, the 2016 election is also the moment when the politics of last year's fight over the Iran nuclear deal will play out. As senators and members of Congress weighed their votes and weighed the merits of the agreement, they were told to weigh carefully as well the political implications of their vote. Whether or not the deal would survive congressional review and, frankly, whether its rejection might start us down the path towards another military conflict in the Middle East hung in the balance as our representatives made their political calculations about the vote. In the end, enough senators and representatives concluded they could survive the political heat and the deal survived. The 2016 election 
is when that political calculus will play out. Will those who voted for the deal be reelected, or will it be the more hawkish and anti-deal candidates like Senator Mark Kirk from Illinois and Ron Johnson from Wisconsin who will find that they are out of office come 2017? Are we possibly at a turning point in the politics of Israel and the Jewish community in the United States? This remains J Street's mission, to prove that there really is meaningful political support for a moderate, rational approach to resolving conflicts that affect the Middle East and Israel. And this evening, we've pulled together an extraordinary panel to explore these questions in depth. I don't want to take any further time away from the panel by introducing them individually. You have their bios in the programs in front of you. I do, however, want to thank them, for all of them, for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us. I hope you'll join me in giving a warm welcome to our eight distinguished guests this evening's program. Let's welcome them to the stage, and I'll turn the mic over to Roger Cohen of The New York Times. Thank you, Jeremy. Good evening, everybody. Um, our subject tonight is how will Israel play in the 2016 elections? Um, as Jeremy just suggested, um, Israel has already played. It played big time in Brooklyn uh, the other night uh, with Bernie Sanders calling uh, the Israeli incursion into Gaza in 2014 disproportionate, calling for respect and dignity to be shown to the Palestinian people, saying that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is not right all the time, and calling uh, for the United States to play an even-handed approach, suggesting strongly that that has not been the approach up to now. And of course, um, we've also had uh, Donald Trump at APAC and all of that, and we'll get to that maybe later. Um, and to pick our way through this uh, tonight, we have, um, as you see, a lot of people up here on the stage. Uh, and the way this is going to uh, unfold, um, uh, according to Jeremy's script at least, if it doesn't all become very unruly, uh, is that um, I will address, try to address three uh, issues uh, in turn. Uh, first of all, um, with what Jeremy called the pundits, I would say perhaps the journalists, uh, that's J.J. Goldberg of The Forward and Mara Eliasson, uh, the national political correspondent for NPR. Uh, then we will uh, go on uh, to, uh, if you like, look at the data, try to look at the data behind uh, whatever ideas emerge at the beginning with um, two pollsters. Uh, who know the numbers, Alan Cooperman, the Director of Religion Research at Pew, and Jim Gerstein, founding partner at GBA Strategies. And finally, uh, we will get to what um, political strategists make of all this. Does it, does it matter? Uh, how much do they think about the Jewish vote? How much do they think that the Jewish vote or appreciation of Israel uh, is changing? And to, to, that's the last three uh, people uh, along the row here. Um, Matt. Nosen Chuck, who uh, has just come out of being uh, President Obama's uh, chief liaison at the White House of the Jewish Community and has now joined the State Department. Uh, Stephanie Shriok, who's the president of Emily's List. And Neera Tandon, uh, president of the Center for American Progress. Uh, well, Mara, maybe I could um, start with you. Um, uh, why do you think uh, Bernie Sanders said what he said? And do you think he's going to pay a political price for it? I think Bernie Sanders said what he said because he believes it. Um, it definitely wasn't out of political calculation. If so, he probably wouldn't have said it in New York in a Democratic primary. On the other hand, the fact that he said it and was cheered wildly in that hall shows you that there's an open debate now. Um, there's a real debate about what it means to be pro-Israel. Now, I, what struck me about his comments 
Some of it was just the mirror image of APAC. In other words, if they say BB's always right, he said BB isn't always right. But also when he talked about being even-handed and, and, and Palestinians, we have to pay attention to their rights too. What he didn't do is say, in order for Israel to survive as a democratic Jewish state, you, we have to do this. In other words, he didn't couch it in terms of Israel's survival, and he didn't make the argument, if you don't do this, if you're not even-handed, there will only be one state, and it won't be the state of Israel over time. But he did say it. It was wildly applauded. I don't think that he is going to make any inroads in New York among the Jewish community because he said it. I Do mean, you think JJ, he's going to suffer? I don't think he's going to suffer a lot. JJ can talk about this a little more. I think he Why might not? suffer because a that's, little bit. That's, that's a new, little perhaps. bit. It's new. I think he's going to suffer less than he would have in previous presidential primaries in New York. Um, because opinion has changed. Because opinion has changed, and now uh, opinion is not so monolithic in the Jewish community. And there's growing impatience with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think there's policies. growing impatience. I think Netanyahu has done so many things to increase that impatience in the Jewish community. You know, we can talk about that chapter and verse, coming to give his speech and mm -hmm. the way he did it. But yes, I think things have changed. Um, but I don't think he's going to benefit because he said it. I just don't think he's going to be hurt okay. tremendously. He might suffer a little bit, but maybe J.J. has a better insight into the Well, JJ, New York maybe you politics. could talk us through it a little bit historically. I mean, what's, what's the backdrop? How, how are these remarks? I mean, actually, if you think about the remarks, they would be utterly unremarkable anywhere else in the world. I mean, if you said these, <laughs> you said these things in Europe, I don't think it would even make the, the newspapers. But here, of course, it, it was a pretty big deal and a pretty big uh, development. So what, what's the backdrop to that? I mean, this isn't a situation that arose overnight. It's been evolving and uh, Jewish views in the Jewish community in the United States of Israel have been slowly evolving. Um, tell us a bit about that. Well, you have to start going back a few decades. Um, oh, I wasn't thinking worst, that long. But the, anyway. worst, <laughs> the worst confrontation between Israel and the White House was right after the uh, Sinai campaign in October 1956, where Dwight Eisenhower essentially freaked out, um, called out Ben-Gurion, um, punished the British government for its involvement in the campaign by crashing the pound. Um, and he got, a month later, 40% of the Jewish vote. That's the highest any Republican has gotten of the Jewish vote since before World War II. Uh, he didn't pay any price. Uh, after 1967, you see more of an attachment of Jews to Israel. Um, it starts to play more of a role. But it still isn't salient. Um, Jimmy Carter lost a lot of the Jewish vote. He's the only one, after, the only Democrat since um, the 20s who got less than 50% of the Jewish vote. But there were so many reasons to vote against him um, that it's hard to say. George Bush Sr. in 1992 famously had a major clash with the organized Jewish community. He got between 12 and 15 percent of the Jewish vote, but every Jew that I talked to afterwards said I didn't vote for him because of his connections to the Christian right. Um, so the Israel issue has not been as salient as it's popularly supposed to be. There's probably 7 to 10 percent of the Jewish vote that will flip back and forth depending on how they view a candidate on Israel. Now, well, the most other of issue, the Jewish vote is solidly democratic. And most of the Jewish really vote, change. but it's been between 60 and 90 percent, mm -hmm. depending on how the candidates are perceived. 90 percent Lyndon Johnson, 90 percent uh, Franklin Roosevelt, 88 uh, percent Bill Clinton. On the other hand, 65 percent um, uh, George McGovern, 60 percent Adlai Stevenson. So there's been that range that goes 25 percent of the Jewish vote can go either way. Now, in terms of the atmosphere of what's acceptable, what does it take to really get that 15% furious at you and out for blood against a perceived anti-Israel candidate um, has changed enormously, and here I would look at three stages. The most obvious is the Iran debate two years, was it last year? Um, that was enormously Already divisive. History. It yeah. was very important for I think the political um, establishment on both sides to see how little it affected 
the vote and the Jewish um, public opinion, uh, what side you took, that most Jews in Congress were able to side with the president, I think it was a revelation for everybody on both sides. I would go further back, after the invasion of Iraq in 2003, actually before it, there was a sense that the Jews, the Jewish community, Jewish leaders were pushing for a war in Iraq for Israel's sake. Um, I think that's, for certainly Israel didn't want that war. Um, Sharon directly told Bush it's a bad idea, but the Jewish neocons, uh, Ed Koch and Mort Zuckerman and so on, were definitely speaking about Israel needs this war. And since then, something changed in the air where it became legitimate to say the Jewish community isn't good for America. The Jewish community is playing a negative role in our public life. That was never permitted, not since before World War II, not since Father Coughlin. All of a sudden you get Mearsheimer and Walt and Michael Lind and all sorts of people saying, oh, the Jewish lobby is bad for us, not just the pro, not just APAC. Um, and the third thing is Netanyahu allying himself with the Republicans. He has so deeply identified himself, so deeply made the Israel issue partisan that an awful lot of Jews as instinctive Democrats are saying, I'm not on that side. It's not, my, it's not my fight. Israel has chosen sides and I'm on the other side. And I think that's the final decisive. Do you think Bernie Sanders will suffer uh, for the position he took? And the same question I asked Mara. Do you, it seems it's an important question. I, to suffer politically? I don't think so. No. I, think, um, I think he had to do it because of his base. Mm -hmm. Because so much of his base is the left. Um, I think that the pundits are more excited about it than the public is. I don't know how widely it was noticed. I certainly know that he didn't say anything that George W. Bush didn't say, that Barack Obama, that Bill Clinton didn't say. He said it on the campaign trail to the- In New uh, York. In New York. So people on television noticed that a lot and went crazy with it. But I don't know how many people noticed mm -hmm. that he was saying it before January 20th and not after January 20th. Mara, when you were reporting uh, all the bad vibes between uh, the president and Prime Minister Netanyahu, all the reasons why President Obama became increasingly uh, exasperated. And when you were reporting on uh, the run-up to the Iran deal and the tremendous friction um, within the country as a whole, but particularly within the Jewish community over that deal, did you feel that something was changing, that something uh, in the Jewish community had changed, that there was exasperation with the Israeli Prime Minister, that suddenly what AIPAC said or what Prime Minister Netanyahu said against the Iran deal uh, didn't matter so much anymore. Yes, definitely. And I'll tell you, for better or for worse, maybe it's good that there's a debate, but the Iran deal, the Jewish community, just as polarized as everything else in American politics. I mean, so why shouldn't Jews be polarized too? everybody else's. But I think that um, there was definitely, JJ described this, Netanyahu kind of crossed a line. He became too embedded in right-wing Republican politics. And you didn't see any Jews in Congress who wanted to support the president getting any blowback because of that. There wasn't any electoral repercussions. It was safe to have a debate about what it means to be pro-Israel. JJ, I think I know the answer, but you know, I think one, one has to ask the question, why, why is the Jewish electorate important anyway? I mean, it's 2% of the population. Most Jews live in New York and California, which, despite what Mr. Trump says, are probably going to remain democratic for the foreseeable future. Um, why, why do politicians care so much about the Jewish vote? There are, are, they, are they, do they have good reason? Um, in 1992, Bill Clinton won four states because of the Jewish vote. The degree to which Jews vote differently from other white people are more likely to vote Democratic. You can measure the number of Jews who voted Democratic that year because they were Jewish. And in North Carolina, not North Carolina, uh, Georgia, Missouri, New Jersey, and I forget the fourth. Uh, whoops, I think is what I'm supposed to say. Um, so, and uh, David Dinkins won the mayoralty because of the Jewish vote. The seven states where Jews constitute 
more than 2% of the electorate, you can more or less double their weight, and I'm sorry, of the population, and because they're older and better educated, um, they're more likely to vote. So if it's 2% of the Massachusetts population, it's gonna be 4% of the electorate. If it's 9% of the New York State population, it's gonna be 15 to 20% of the electorate. What about That's funding? Funding? <laughs> um, up until recently, I was under the impression that the Democrats had to go to Jews. You ask a Democratic fundraiser, where do you get the money from? Um, well, from trial lawyers, from toys, from generic drugs, basically from Hollywood, from Jews. Um, those are all essentially Jewish industries because Jews... Is that are, not the critical political issue? Well, when you're raising money, you need to find rich people who aren't right-wing. And there are not... <laughs> pardon me for saying this. There are, <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> there are not many rich Goyim who are, right, are left-wing. Um, <laughs> forgive me for saying that. Um, this election, I saw... Well, I saw something yesterday that knocked my socks off, which is... Um, donor figures from the Center for Responsible Politics, opensecrets.org, which were massaged by the Washington Post, and then I went to their own website. From February and, and March, of the top 50 donors to 527s and, um, and uh, super PACs, of the top 50 donors, 36 and 37, depending on the month, were Republican, and so 14 or 13 were Democrats. 20 were Jewish. 20 of the 50 were Jewish, of whom 12 both months were Jewish Democrats and eight both months were Jewish Republicans. Now, to, for the Jewish Republicans to be almost half of the Jewish donor group surprised me. I didn't expect it to be, now it's 40%, eight out of 20. Um, but it still looks high to me. Uh, secondly, the, um, the Democrats got their money, the big money. There was one non-Jew who was giving big money to the Democrats. That's, that's gigantic in the terms of American politics. If Bernie Sanders sets a new model, then this may change and the, the, the weight of Jews in the political system may go down. Thank you. Um, Alan, let me, let me turn to you. Um, so here we are talking about shifts, um, but are there shifts? Are there real shifts? Are they, are they measurable? Do you see data, you look at it and you think, wow, something is going on here, or, or, or are we just talking about a few headlines? That's a great question, Roger. Um, and uh, polling has its limits, and we need to be aware of them. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the Jewish vote over the long term, I see a lot of consistency and would really call out the consistency as what jumps out of the numbers rather than the change. So in every presidential election going back 20 years, um, Jews have voted, according to exit polls, uh, between 70 and 80 percent, maybe as low as 69 percent, as high as 79 percent uh, for the Democratic candidate. Uh, in Pew Research Center polling, asking about political identification, uh, the number of Jews we capture in random digit dial telephone polls varies from year to year. We certainly don't get enough in any one poll uh, to, to talk, talk about Jews, but we aggregate them. So annual aggregated numbers, never lower than 60%, seldom higher than 75% uh, Democratic leaning. Uh, again, you were absolutely right when you said Jews make up 2% of the U.S. adult public. They also can fairly consistently make up about 2% of the electorate. So we're talking about little blips that amount to fractions of 1% of the electorate. Now, of course, politicians care about every vote, and in very tight elections, a very small number of voters can be seen as shifting that election. So, but you know, about JJ says seven states or whatever, but the first thing that occurs to me is, I, I bet there are half a dozen other demographic groups that you could look at whose shifts were also big enough to have accounted for that difference. When you get these very tight elections, you know, any group can be seen as having shifted. But what about the, the issues? Uh, what about um, opinions within the Jewish community on Israel? Uh, I, I recall, I think it was Pew, at the time of the 2014 uh, Gaza 
incursion, you measured, I think it was Pew, measured by age group um, responses to the war. And it was striking that in the 18 to 29 age bracket, where there's very strong support for Bernie Sanders uh, now, um, that was the only group that blamed Israel, I think, more than Hamas um, for what was happening. Every other age group uh, blamed Hamas more than Israel. But uh, is, that, is that, for example, uh, a, a sign of, of a generational shift underway toward a more critical or even hostile uh, view of Israel? Uh, the poll you're referring to is of the general public, and it's very true in the general public uh, that uh, younger folks have different attitudes than older folks. Mm -hmm. Also true in the Jewish public, uh, though I don't know on this particular issue uh, where younger Jews stood from older Jews because we didn't have that in our survey at the time we did the survey in 2013. It was before the Gaza war. But one thing that stands out consistently in surveys that have been done of the Jewish population going back decades is that younger Jews uh, are by a variety of measures less attached to Israel than older Jews. But note, I just said that's been true for a long time. So there is a legitimate argument among sociologists and others who care about these things as to whether what is going on is that the Jewish population as a whole is shifting, becoming a little less supportive of Israel, and younger Jews are the vanguard of that, when you or, say whether, less attached, or whether yeah. as people get older, mm. they become more attached to Israel. Both things are plausible, mm. and the cross-sectional kinds of polls that I do cannot cannot solve that, or settle that argument. It's a very strong and legitimate argument, one that needs to take place. So you mean there's the notion that, okay, these people, everyone grows older and grows more conservative, so it doesn't really matter in the end. Well, I would just say, again, it has consistently been true that the Jewish population as a whole in the United States is very supportive of Israel. Mm -hmm. It's also not monolithic. Let's take, for example, the question of settlements. So the way we ask this question is, uh, do you think that the continued construction of settlements helps Israel's security, hurts Israel's security, or makes no difference? Mm -hmm. Well, there's no majority on any one of those positions among American Jews. The plurality position, the most popular choice, mm -hmm. is that settlements hurt Israel's security. 42% of American Jews told us that in 2013. But remember, there's a substantial share on the other side. The other thing to, to bear in mind, you will often hear people saying, the first thing I said, Jews consistently vote Democratic. That hasn't changed and it's not going to change. You'll hear that. You'll also hear people say, ah, but there's a rising share of Jewish Republicans. And you know what? There's also some truth to that. You have to understand the changing demographics of the American Jewish community. Orthodox and especially ultra-Orthodox are rising in absolute numbers and as a share of American Jews. And while Jews as a whole consistently lean Democratic, Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jews as a whole consistently lean Republican. So it can be true at one and the same time when you have, in fact, two parts of the Jewish community growing in absolute size and in share, the most conservative part, Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jews, and the most liberal part, younger Jews of, as we call them in Pew speak, not Jew speak, Pew speak, Jews of no religion, which you might think of as cultural or, or ethnic Jews. People who, when you ask them what their religion is, do not say Jewish, but they tell you they have a Jewish parent. They consider themselves Jewish. A very young group, rising in size, about a fifth of American Jews, growing, okay, very liberal. So you've got a kind of polarization in the American Jewish community, and it's why you can have in fact have a more visible Republican group within the Jewish community that, re that Republican candidates are targeting. You see that. It's real. There's no point in denying it. And at, Shel the, same time, and and at the same time, the Jewish community as a whole in this country leans very consistently and overwhelmingly democratic. Thank Jim. Was yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, do you see um, a generational shift or other shifts that uh, are striking in the data you look at? Uh, on generational shifts, I think what's, it, uh, what's very interesting is when you look at how connected the millennial generation is internationally. Mm -hmm. And I think the impact of growing up under the Iraq War, uh, and, and you see how 
the multilateral Ted Cruz, Donald Trump approach to foreign policy is not necessarily where younger Jews are. We have something actually with, as it related to um, Palestinian recognition at the UN and some questions around the UN, and it was striking to see the difference among younger Jews, how there was less hostility towards the UN and more openness toward, uh, uh, toward Palestinian recognition at the UN than older Jews. That was an unusual thing. I think overall, I don't, you know, I don't see big, big differences. I think what Alan points out with the Orthodox population is very important and is more about denomination than anything. When it comes to uh, what JJ and Mara and Alan were talking about in terms of uh, the Jewish vote, I think I look at it through priorities and values. Okay, priorities. Jews care a lot about Israel. It doesn't mean. That, and they're emotionally attached to Israel, and it's important to them. It doesn't mean that they're voting on Israel. And the question of whether there's been a shift in this... So what are they voting on? They're it, voting on social issues? Or yeah, what? so I like to say Jews are people too, right? They vote just like uh, on the same issues that Americans vote, okay? When we ask in our uh, election night polls that we've conducted for J Street in 2010, 2012, 2014, we ask t the top two issues that determined your vote in this election. And the top, is, top issue is the economy. And it's followed by health care. And it's followed by the same things that when you look at the exit polls nationally. Israel, when we ask about Israel, it is ranged between 7 to 10 percent as one of the top two issues. So basically 90 percent are not making it a top issue. It doesn't mean it's not important to people. In fact, candidates have to pass a threshold of credibility on the issue that, where they're seen as not being hostile to Israel. And frankly, it's a pretty easy threshold to pass. And every presidential candidate has and will continue to pass that threshold. The, um, and then once you pass that threshold, people move on to other issues. And the issues line up very much. And the reason that you've seen this consistency in who they support in, in presidential elections and also down ballot is because on all these other issues, as well as Israel, by the way, their views line up with the democratic uh, worldview. The, when it comes to the Middle East and when it comes to Israel, I'd like to, I, I, I'd, I think that the Iran debate was a watershed moment. And, and I'm not just playing to the crowd here, but, but J Street had a remarkable year. And what J Street did around the Iran debate <laughs> is, yeah, imagine how different the debate would have been if J Street wasn't involved. And, but I'm not just playing to the crowd here. I'm, I want to say that the, the, the point is pundits, I think punditry, whether it was on the Hill or in the media, kind of caught up to where American Jewish opinion was. I want, the, the question is whether that will play out when it comes to Israel. And I think it may. And I think because things, what people have witnessed over the last year is, is watershed, is changing. And... The, the last thing I'd say on this particular topic is when we ask people about Israel, Jews, Jews are not the hawkish constituency that is conventional wisdom. Alan pointed out a question on settlements. We've asked about comprehensive peace agreements, overwhelming support, two-state solution, overwhelming support. We ask about the role that the United States should play in helping the Israelis and Palestinians resolve the conflict. And Jews overwhelmingly support the U.S. playing an active role. And even, it, even if it means public disagreements between uh, uh, Israel and Palestine. So if that's the way States. Jews think, how have the leading Jewish organizations in the United States been able to effectively distort uh, what Jews really feel on, on, at the political level? I don't know if that's my um, mic or... I don't know if we... So this goes back to shifts. I don't think Jewish public opinion has been shifting. I think that it's whether punditry is shifting and whether Jewish organizations will shift to keep up with where the constituents are. Mm -hmm. And Well, the emergence of J Street suggests it, it might, right? I mean, the growth with J Street is pretty impressive. And yeah, we, we were on a lot of political campaigns. And when J Street first came out, campaigns would say, uh, they. They, this issue would come up, no one had heard of J Street in 2008. 2010, they say, yeah, J Street's, 
I've heard of J Street. Let's see what everybody else thinks. 2012, 2014, they want to know how do you get J Street's endorsement. I mean, things are changing. Look at, look at the Maryland Senate race. Two, two candidates, strong candidates, both were coveting the J Street endorsement. I, I think things are changing, okay. and it, the question is, is where are, where's the organized world going to be? Uh, organized Jewish world going to be on this, and is it going to be reflective of where the Jewish Jewish public opinion is, or not? Yeah. Matt, I'm going to bring you in a minute, but JJ just wanted to say a brief thing um, about that. Uh, on the uh, Jewish organizations, you talk to any of their leaders, and they will tell you they speak for the people who show up at their meetings and who pay their bills. Um, the conservative small C Jews, Orthodox Jews, tend to be more involved. Liberal Jews tend to be less involved, and so the weight of the Jewish right within the organized world is far more than its weight in the, uh, in the polls. Matt, um, you've just come out of a job at the White House where you were liaising with Jews day after day. Uh, we all take <laughs> our job. hat off to you. Um, what was it Love like... That. Let's take the Iran deal. I mean, what was it like trying to navigate your way to getting that deal approved? You must have had a lot of people shouting at you. Uh, I have my share uh, yeah. of conversations with, with uh, folks on all sides of the issue. And this was, an, this was not just an effort that was compressed into the 60 days of the congressional review period. This was an effort that really commenced in the fall of 20. 13, when it was announced that there uh, was about to be an interim uh, agreement. And, you know, we made an effort from the very start to, uh, you know, engage with the organized Jewish community, with the leaders who, uh, you know, represent that community and who typically uh, come into the White House to meet with us uh, to, you know, explain that this is what was going to happen and to ask. Uh, you know, for their uh, indulgence to give us an opportunity to let it go into effect and see if it worked. You know, and obviously from that early time, there was a great deal of skepticism uh, around the interim agreement, even, you know, from those uh, leaders. Uh, but well, we J Street were, was the only organization supporting it, right? Right. I mean, at that point, you know, and, and J Street was a, a voice, but it hadn't, you know, coalesced into yeah. the sort of loud voice that it ultimately became when we finally had a a deal. I mean, and, and for the most part, you know, the, a number of the, the major groups kind of held back and, and were willing to kind of suspend their judgments uh, initially. I mean, not all of them, obviously, but, but some of the key ones. Uh, you know, then the interim agreement, which, of course, they, many of them were very skeptical of it, and of course, the Prime Minister was openly critical of it. Uh, as time you know, marched on and we moved closer to a final agreement, then those same skeptics and critics became advocates for keeping the interim agreement in place, right? They liked that and didn't want a final mm -hmm. agreement. So then when the parameters were announced in April of 20, uh, uh, 2015, I mean, that was a watershed moment because that's when, you know, people and the pundits realize, wow, this, the, the parameters of this deal, the framework, is actually pretty good. And so the, the elements of what seemed to be a pretty good deal were, were in place. And so we then were in a period where we knew there was a lead up of some time until a final agreement would be announced. And during that time, of course, the administration agreed to this legislation that would afford uh, Congress a review period. And you know, an opportunity to vote up or down on the deal, and then the president could, uh, you know, if, if the, if the uh, deal was voted down, he could uh, veto that. So we were in a period where we were very cognizant that the Jewish um, community was going to be a critical voice in this debate, and we undertook a real effort to engage the community. And when I mean, you know, and the entire community, right? I mean, the president has always believed that you have to engage not only with your supporters, but also with your uh, opponents. And he was, on this issue, extremely willing uh, to do so. But I think one important aspect of this particular uh, fight was that you know, everybody agreed on the objective, right, which was to prevent Iran from attaining a nuclear weapon. You know, 
the Prime Minister uh, you know, and the others had called for the international community to step up and take on this issue. The international community stepped up and took on this issue. So uh, ultimately, you know, we said that we had a deal that was a good deal that would achieve the objective of preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And our opponents said it was a bad deal that wouldn't achieve that objective. But we agreed on the objective. So I like to think about a you know, bizarro universe where those attractors would have said, wow, isn't it great that the Obama administration has taken on this issue that has you know, answered the call and stepped up to address this issue. I mean, you, know, you could imagine that, but there were political considerations that precluded that from happening. But I think it is very important that there was you know, agreement on, essentially, on the ultimate objective. And so we uh, were talking about the means Yeah, but there was a very there. different view of how to achieve that objective. And yeah. I imagine that when you said to some of these leaders, we firmly believe this is in the American national interest, this deal. And not only that, we believe that it is firmly in Israel's uh, interest, that it's the best deal that can be won for Israel's security. I imagine that several of these people came back to you and said, well, hang on a second, aren't the Israelis the best place to judge that? And isn't the Prime Minister of Israel the best place to judge that? And he thinks this deal is terrible. Right. Uh, he, he, he was absolutely vehement in, uh, in saying that this would be very, very bad for Israel. Um, right. How did you answer that? I mean, and the, the, you know, to my, my answer is that, you know, the facts mattered. I mean, as I said, when, a when April, when the deal, the framework was announced, people recognized that it actually had the potential to be a pretty good deal. And then when the final deal was announced in July uh, and it was evaluated, you know, we could say credibly that it was a good, good deal that achieved its objective, that it extended the breakout time, and then you had a debate uh, that ensued over 60 days which, where it was kind of a spaghetti on the wall effort. I mean, they, you know, the opponents would throw up an issue, you know, this 24-day uh, in, infection uh, red herring or other things, and we had a, you know, rapid response, you know, peace rooms, we called it, uh, you know, where we were prepared to respond to each and every one of those uh, contentions. And, you know, it was incredibly important from the start uh, when we recognized, thanks to the polling that Tim did and also that the LA Jewish Journal did, that you know, a majority of the Jewish community supported the deal. And that, for me and others around the White House, was an aha moment. Like, okay, that's important to know. That's important to recognize. And I got a, you know, an email from a senior official said, okay, Matt, your job in the next 60 days is to talk to every Jew in America. So, you know, if I missed any of you, I apologize. But, uh, you know, yeah, I you got a call? Uh, and, and the fact do you is, think it was a watershed moment, or do you think that's just a watershed what moment the, for, for the Jewish? It was a moment in which something shifted, and the Jewish community and and indeed uh, the Congress said no to Prime Minister Netanyahu and no to APAC. Uh, we we know what we think is in the American interest, and and it's not what you happen to think it is, and we're going to do it. I think it was an important moment because I think it. Watershed it, moment. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it was a watershed moment. I mean, look, you had a group like J Street that was working incredibly hard and, yeah. you know, and effectively uh, in support of the deal. You got a majority of the Jewish members of Congress, people who have impeccable pro-Israel credentials, all carefully considering that deal and ultimately coming out um, in support of it. And I can tell you that if they thought it was a bad deal, they would not have voted for that deal. It was not a situation where the president would have been able to twist their arms and get them to vote for that deal. There's no way. They would have come out against it. But, you know, hours and hours were spent. I mean, there's a, a story that was reported about when the president met with a group of members who were on the fence, you know, in the diplomatic room. They, had to, they met for an hour. They had to go vote. It was an evening. They came back. Uh, he said, come on back. They came back for another three hours. I mean, his capacity and interest and willingness to engage with members of Congress and members of the Jewish community. We had a meeting, you know, with Jewish leaders in the cabinet room on his birthday, and he was late for his birthday dinner. I think the first lady was having a fit, saying, come on, we got to go out, Barack, you know. But he was willing to stay there and, and talk to these leaders because he really wanted to get across to them uh, his point, his willingness to listen, his understanding that the opposition within the Jewish community was not, uh, you know, it wasn't partisan, it wasn't politically motivated, but it was born, you know, for the many opponents out of a serious concern about Israel's security. And he took, 
he took them at their word on that point. I think that was very important. Do you think the president has been frustrated by the limited leverage that he has in dealing with Israel? And do you think any of the trends that we've been discussing tonight might give some future president greater leverage over Israel if the backdrop is a Jewish community that is supportive but critical of Israel rather than a Jewish community that is uncritically supportive of Israel? I mean, might another president, let's not specify what leverage that might be, but I think we can all imagine it. But do you think, so do you think the president's been frustrated by the leverage he has and do you think that might change in the future? I mean, I, I think the, you know, I mean, the president is, you know, at, at his core, very, uh, you know, pro-Israel and supportive of Israel. And, I don't question and, that. And, and, uh, and I think that he recognizes, you know, that there are complicated dynamics with respect to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and also in the Jewish community. I mean, I think as you look, you know, from our perspective, looking at the American Jewish community today, you have merging voices like J Street, but you do have, you know, other voices that, you know, as JJ said, represent and speak for those people who are, strongly affiliated with organizations that are, you know, comp comprise the kind of, you know, mainline Jewish organizations. And they're not in the same place uh, at this point uh, that J Street is in. And it's, you know, it's going to take time, I think, for, you know, that kind of dynamic to play out. And so, so you think there's a trend line? I think there's been a, certainly it was a, a watershed moment in terms of the expression of the voice of, of uh people in the American Jewish community who had confidence in, you know, the president's commitment to Israel's security as reflected in the Iran deal and their willingness to support it. Stephanie, um, we've been listening to a lot of male voices, so uh, <laughs> we'll see what it's past time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've advised a lot of um, politicians over the years mm -hmm. on, on these issues, and um, tell us what it was like in the past when you were advising somebody um, beginning a campaign in terms of what had to be said or not said uh, to win the Jewish vote and how that's different today, if it is. Well, as I've listened to all of these amazing comments and, and a lot of conversation about the Jewish vote, I think the, the main question that was asked uh, to JJ was about the money. I think that is, a, that is a big piece of, of this story and cannot be overlooked at all. Uh, I was thinking of some of the conversations I had over the summer with some of our federal candidates. I mean, Emily's List works with 50 plus federal candidates every year. Um, most of those federal candidates have been in the state legislature or haven't run before at all. Uh, they have not looked beyond their cities, let alone their state borders. Goodness gracious, there's another world out there beyond the United States. And they jump in to this, really trying to change the economy and build jobs and you know, help their communities. And this issue is very, very far, not just in the eyes of the voters, as we just heard, but in, in the eyes of so many of our candidates. And so when something like the Iran deal came up early in an election cycle where we already had candidates running who were not going to take a vote but were asked for position, there was a lot of angst over what to do and how to handle that. And these are folks who have not been briefed, do not have access to these briefings, do not have any of the information other than what they're reading in the newspaper. And, and it was a really trying time to help guide the candidates and someone who's been doing this now for two decades, I realized that I had the freedom as an operative, as a strategist, to say to some of our candidates, which I in fact did, is do what you feel is right here. Because we- As Bernie can, Sanders did the other night, this, presumably. Do, exactly, because I think there is enough there's enough energy around all of it now than there used to be. So if you decide to be against the deal, there's going to be folks that are going to be with you. If you're going to be for the deal, there's going to be folks that are going to be with you. Now, I say that is that was the first time I went, wow, 
Well, what There's about, really what about a change you, well, because in the, I was going to say. What about if the, you said, uh, sorry, just, I mean, just yep. what about if you said, uh, uh, well, I want to say that I believe uh, Israel should stop building settlements and get out of most of the West Bank. Uh, what advice? Would that be going too far? I would send them straight to J Street. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, I do, so thank you. <laughs> and, and that is a significant difference here. So I started as a finance director. I, originally, I, I worked for candidates in the 90s as their finance director, and I would come on uh, on a congressional race. I'm a 20-something kid who also knows nothing beyond the state borders, let alone overseas. And you thought about where you're going to go to raise the money that you needed to raise to win a race. And you went to labor and you went to the choice community, and you went to the Jewish community. But before you went to the Jewish community, you had a conversation with the lead APAC person in your state, and they made it clear that you needed a paper on Israel. And so you called all of your friends who already had a paper on Israel that was designed by APAC, and we made that your paper. This was before there was a campaign manager, or a policy director, or a field director, because you got to raise money before you do all that. I have written more Israel papers than you can imagine. I'm from Montana. I barely knew where Israel was until I looked at a map. And the poor campaign manager would come in or the policy director and I'd be like, here's your paper on Israel. This is our policy. We've sent it all over the country because this is how we've raised money. And so, and so oh, you oh, ask, what oh. does that mean? That means these candidates who you know, were farmers or school teachers or business women uh, ended up having an Israel pa position without having any significant conversation. But you're saying all Israel papers were the same. They were, were identical. Very similar. Incredibly Until similar. Until the emergence of, I guess, J Street and I, some different ideas. That's I exactly mean, for a country, right. I mean, it wasn't that for a country of more than 300 ideas, million no. people with lots of different views on lots of different subjects, that's a pretty amazing cornering of the market, isn't it? It's astounding. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at it, as I was getting ready for tonight, it, it's shocking. And you know, Jeremy Benamy and I uh, had the great pleasure, thank you, I agree, he um, had the great pleasure of meeting each other during the Howard Dean campaign. And, and one of the conversations we had was, oh my gosh, is there really only one foreign policy on this? Because it felt like it, and that was the case. And now, now we've got candidates who come in who can get briefed on a whole set of issues related to Israel, and they can sit down with APAC, and they can sit down with J Street, and there are others, and it's incredibly important. And so, yes, this country had one very clear, unmovable set of policies, and it wasn't driven by voters. Mm -hmm. It wasn't driven by voters. What, year would, you, what year would you place the change in? It started in about 2006, uh, and definitely by 2008, you could feel it. And I managed a Senate race in 2006, and we, <laughs> we, were just, I was just, we were like, should we talk to J Street? I don't know. Are we going to get in trouble? Is it going to cause us problems? Boy, I kind of like what they're saying. Like, that conversation happened. But what were people fearful of? Were they fearful that... You know, if we say X, we won't be able to go to Miami anymore. We won't be able to go to New York. No more St. Louis, no or... more Cleveland, no more certain parts of New York. Yeah, you, know, you just, you thought that the money was going to be gone. It was just going to dry up. Yeah, overnight. and this isn't about presidential money, where there's so much money coming in a presidential. These are about house races mm -hmm. and Senate races that are different. They're not getting millions and millions of contributions at $27 a pop. They really have to go get those $5,000 pack checks from the pro-Israel pack in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Nira, you've been, you've been very patient. Yes, sorry, uh, thank sorry. you for that. Um, you know Hillary Clinton pretty well, I, I believe. <laughs> and, close. Um, and she has more or less gone by the, in this campaign, the, let's say the classical playbook on, on Israel has been... Um, very, very supportive and pretty much uncritical, I guess. Um, I guess I would. Do you, do you think like that, that? Do you think, first of all, do you think that's so? And do you think for her, what does that reflect? Is, is that her, her, her intimate belief or her calculation or some mixture of the two? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you know, I worked for Hillary for a long time, so uh, my experience with her is when she says something, it's her intimate belief. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, the issue of Israel with Hillary is very long-standing, as you will probably recall, it was Hillary Clinton in 1998, who was the first person in the Clinton administration to call for a Palestinian state, took a lot of heat for doing that. She ran in a Senate race, I know JJ will remember this, others well, as well, where she was uh, was you know, often attacked for being too close, uh, for being too studious of the two-state solution, of being uh, too mindful of the need to recognize a Palestinian state. Uh, this year, you know, she has not only talked about Israel and the Palestinian situation. She's obviously talked a lot about the Iran nuclear deal her role in starting the Iran nuclear deal, the idea behind the Iran nuclear deal, which is creating sanctions, the sanctions infrastructure. Uh, obviously, she's championed that in her speeches throughout the year. I think the issue around Israel and uh, the Palestinian state and the pa issues around Arab-Israeli peace Obviously, she had her own experience as Secretary of State negotiating ceasefire uh, between uh, Egypt and Israel that really affected Hamas. Um, but I'd say on these issues, the, the challenge we have, uh, if I might step into foreign policy for one moment, is that in a really fundamental way, I see the U.S. and Israel diverging. Over the long term, I think the U.S. is becoming more progressive, ultimately progressive, I would say, on these issues, which is to say, you know, I personally find it a little depressing that it's only a plurality of Jewish Americans who think settlements are an obstacle to peace. That, I wish that number was actually higher mm -hmm. uh, because it is my fundamental view that settlements are an obstacle to peace. But I do think over the long term, the, the most important aspect of the Iran nuclear deal, which we also worked very hard on at the Center for American Progress, uh, is that it created a sense that there was a divergence. And that actually taking a position in this direction, uh, the, where you had Netanyahu so violently speaking out the other way, uh, did not create a political climate that was uh, impossible to weather and that Democrats today on the Hill, you know, feel like they have some battle scars, but it's not like some bruising debate they can't weather. So I think that is a fundamentally important issue. The thing I worry about them really even fundamentally more is public opinion in Israel, which seems to be moving very much against uh, peace over the long term. And so that you're saying is this, so a move to, in a progressive direction in the United States and in a reactionary direction yes. in Israel. Okay, yes. so you extrapolate from that, and what? And so this goes to your point earlier, which was, I think you were driving at the point uh, with Matt that could the United States create pressure over the long term with Israel? I was, yeah. Yes. And so I think the question, just to jump in there for Matt, uh, <laughs> is that we have this challenge, right? Which is that even if the, even if the, uh, if, even in the, if the wingspan for action or the aperture for action in the United States widens about what can happen, the challenge is it seems to be closing in Israel. So the ability of an Israeli leader to be forced into any position is very hard because of the reality. So that, I think, is, is something fundamentally we have to, we, I, we worry about, and we work uh, hard on these issues. That is, that is a depressing, that has been a depressing trajectory. Um, Do you so see anything you, that could uh, arrest that trend or... or I think or build bridges. Uh, I mean, ultimately, here, you know, we're I all, do. We're I all do. interested in, in an Israeli Palestinian resolution, peace. And ultimately, if all these trends that we're talking about don't actually change anything, in fact, may even be completely divorced from what's going on on the ground, which uh, looks very, very intractable, uh, then that's, you know, a very unhappy situation, right? So I agree. I mean, I see one. You, 
you know, so many of those issues uh, in Israel uh, are are affected by a sense of, of uh, security on the ground. But I would say one thing of the last few years is that uh, the prime minister, and I think this has been a terrible move, but the prime minister has used his... Uh, uh, his poor relationship with the president to give him an excuse. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's a question going into the future. An Whether excuse for what? For inaction, doing nothing. Um, and, and I think that is completely There's unjustified. There's always some excuse, though. I mean, of course. It was, I a, think that it was I think, Iran for a long I, time? Was I want to be clear yeah. that it is completely unjustified. Mm -hmm. The president, I mean, as we've seen with the Iron Dome, with a military action with the state, the actions he's taken has been a strong, fervent ally. I, I, it's completely unjustified, but he has used that. I think if you read domestic press in Israel, you see that he has used an alleged friction to his benefit. I think that's a question going into the future, whether it's possible that with that ex if there's a change in that, I mean, he'll probably use anything. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, a, you know, he's a very skillful Do you think politician. if President Clinton perceived as more friendly to Israel and uh, I think there's a I can't sort of consensus now that the Cairo speech are not going to Israel and, you know, got things off on the wrong foot. Um, do you think a President Clinton or indeed a President Trump could uh, change... Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll throw that in there. What the heck? I don't, uh, do I don't you think know that... if I could say that. I, I would say, the one thing I would say is yeah. that if you look at the 1990s, the pr President Clinton, the, I'll say, the first President Clintons, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> strong support in Israel did create a lot of pressure on the Israeli government. I think that is a fair point. Now, again, these are different times. The situation in many ways has gotten uh, considerably worse. <laughs> uh, we are years from the being on the cusp, you know, where people were actually talking to each other and negotiating. Um, so I, I don't want to say that it would be, yeah, it's not my, I don't know that it would be different. It's just a question I have. Um. Well, the, um, the sort of organized progression down the line here has now ended, so anybody can jump in at any time. Uh, Mara, oh, can I, I say one thing to... about a President Trump? <laughs> I could... Mara, could I ask you something and, and, and then say also whatever you wanted to say? Um, what did you make of, uh, of Donald Trump at, at APAC and the, um, the ovation he got and some people cheering, not everyone, but a lot of pe a lot of. Jews at APAC cheering Donald Trump, and of course, some of Trump's positions on Israel um, have been uh, have even approached in some regards what, what Bernie Sanders said the other night. So mm -hmm. how do you see all that? Well, I, I guess I see it in the way I see everything else about Donald Trump. It's completely inconsistent, and one time he says he's going to be a, a neutral broker, whatever, what were the words he used? Uh, um, something like that, neutral broker. The next thing he's getting standing ovations from APAC. I guess that's when his son-in-law wrote a speech for him, um, and he wasn't wasn't just stream of consciousness. But also, APEC had to apologize for that afterwards. So so it was pretty extraordinary. What I wanted to ask about about Trump to the pollsters um, is what happened in the audience at APEC to Donald Trump, the sign of any kind of openness in the Jewish community to Trump. Usually, when there's populism and nativism, Jews think it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to anti-Semitism. But maybe there's an opening because his family, you know, his in-law, son-in-law is Jewish, and he talked to APEC that way. That's the first question I had. And the other question I had for, the other, for Alan, the other pollster, is, well, answer that first, and then I'll, then I'll, ask, then I'll ask Alan. <laughs> So in the J Street poll we did last summer, we asked favorability on Donald Trump among Jews, and he had a 75% unfavorable rating, okay? Now, to put some perspective on that, I think the only constituency that I've seen where it's worse in America is the Hispanic constituency, and I think there's some reasons why. But um, 
But, and by the way, anytime you hear people say, oh, Trump's going to bring out new voters, I think he is going to bring out new voters. They're just not voting Republican. They're going to be voting Democratic. Yeah. Yes, here, here. Um, and and yep. especially in states where it matters, it. down ballot. Mm -hmm. um, but in understanding the Jewish vote, and, uh, and it actually, I think, does relate a bit to the Iran debate, there are a few driving pieces to it. And one of it is rooted in beliefs and values, which we've seen in in uh, the public re uh, public religion research institute polling, a nonpartisan uh, research institute, which did a lot of uh, research on uh, views on on marriage equality and abortion and taxing the wealthy, where it was very as well as Israel, where the views were very much in line with democratic uh, uh, worldview. But the other piece, so it's it's support for Democrats, but also Jews don't they really don't like Republicans, okay, in big numbers. And, and, and JG referred to the references with the uh, uh, the Christian right earlier, and but this is a big challenge for the Republican Party if they are going to try and nibble at the edges with this small constituency to draw votes, and the reaction you see at APEC is obviously totally disconnected, and Donald Trump is not going to draw in Jewish votes. I mean, it's, just, it's not going to happen. Can, can I make it, one point on that, which yeah. I think we we lose sight of? I'll just speak really quickly on this. Um, I mean, I've done politics in New York. I ran, I worked on two Senate races in New York. Uh, definitely difficult politics there. But I think we underestimate uh, how particularly toxic a Donald Trump is for Jewish voters because it's not, it's not like he's just a Republican. I mean, he is a, he's basically a uh, populist who breeds, he attacks particular groups who are different from him. He attacks minority groups. Jews are a religious minority with a experience of being that group that was attacked. I think that his attacks on Latinos, women, other groups, particularly play badly with Jewish Americans who have, who remember, and actually their experience of social justice in the 60s, through today is supporting civil rights of people who look different from the mainstream. That is a tradition within Jewish social activism that is, it is strong and, and, and uh, grounding for older Jews and younger Jews. And he affronts all of them in a particular way that I think they will be a very strong voice against him, stronger than other constituencies. Can I just yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I forgot to say something earlier, so but I want to respond to that. But I also want to note that today was the um, 40th anniversary, the yard site on the Hebrew calendar of Phil Oaks. Um, <laughs> having said that, the Orthodox population within the Jewish community in New York is now something like 35%. Uh, the the fertility, the birth rate in the Orthodox community is phenomenal. So much more, I believe it's 60% of school children, Jewish school, school aged children in New York City are Orthodox. And within the Orthodox community, the suspicion of ethnic and racial minorities runs very yeah. high. There has been since, really since 68, a sense uh, on both sides that People of color in America are identified with the sort of a third world liberation sense, which Orthodox Jews especially see as they're out to get us. And so Donald Trump plays well in a certain segment. Now, I don't know if it'll turn New York Republican, um, <laughs> but looking down the road, they, Baltimore has a large Orthodox population. Phil, uh, Cleveland has a large Orthodox population. And in those places, I think there may be enough to make a difference. So you think their destiny in the Middle East and in Brooklyn. Right. So you <laughs> think there's a Republican yeah. opportunity we're, we're talking, in the? We're not talking about close states. And it, there's no way. Oh, I, 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 okay. I, I I will go out on a limb and say that the Democratic candidate for president is going to win New York State. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. It, it, these we're not talking about. I mean, this is an important conversation in terms of the substance of it and what's happening within the Jewish population, for sure. I don't, I don't dispute that. But if you're talking about winning elections, changes like that are not 
going to overcome much bigger changes that are going on in the country. And I think that's the important thing to understand. Why does this matter for J Street? Is because that, that analysis is important when you look at the, the community, but when you're looking at punditry and how it's going to really affect things, and when senators are making a vote on the Iran agreement, that's not the calculation, or whether it's, in that, whether it's something that's, even, that's less earth shattering, less relevant to world peace than the Iran agreement, but something that's, that's a, a political issue, a more political issue, it still shouldn't, that shouldn't be the calculation. I think there are much bigger things for, for, uh, for elected officials in terms of their own political calculations than those kinds of changes on the margin. And as, going back to the original question, about an hour ago is, will punditry, will things catch up mm. to where Jewish voters and where the country is? And I, I think that in the wake of the Iran agreement that we are going to see that move in that direction. Can I ask Alan yeah, something? Sure. You, something you said earlier really jumped out at me, and we're talking about changes and watersheds, that older Jews tend to be more supportive of Israel or is the yeah. Israeli government than younger Jews. And maybe you said that would change as Jews get older, kind of like voters positions on economics change when they have to pay taxes and get a mortgage, you know, as they get older. But it strikes me that maybe the opposite will happen, because as these young voters get older, why would they change their views on Israel? Why would they all of a sudden li like Bibi Netanyahu when they didn't when they were in their 20s? I'm wondering if the aging of the, the current young generation of Jews changes you think the Bibi whole... will be around 20 years? No, no. What I, well, what? What I, yeah. or, or some other right-wing um, <laughs> Israeli politician. All I'm saying is that why wouldn't that, those young Jewish views on Israel, change the entire community's views rather than switching <clears throat> when they get older? So that's a great question. And Jews are people like others. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that happens to people, uh, unfortunately, is that they do die. And so the composition of a public changes, and the people, the, the younger cohort becomes a larger cohort as it moves through the pipeline through generational replacement. So if you look at US Jewish opinion on Israel um, by a variety of different measures, and try to go back through various kinds of polls that have been done going back a few decades, you will see, as I said earlier, consistently that younger Jews have been less attached to Israel than older Jews. But the overall level of attachment of the American Jewish population to Israel has been steady. So younger Jews were less attached 20 years ago, but the American Jewish population is roughly as attached today to Israel huh. as it was 20 years ago. Now this is masking, again, some demographic change because the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox population, which is the most attached, is growing as a share. And, at the same time, the Jews of no religion, which is the most liberal share, is also growing. And it's the kind of the traditional middle of American Judaism, reform and conservative Jews, that are shrinking as a share of the overall Jewish population. Matt, so you, it's, yeah. well, this is why we don't make prognostications. I would like to say that I agree with JJ. If you're thinking about Trump, then the question isn't whether Jews as a whole are going to vote for Trump. Jews as a whole lean overwhelmingly democratic. They're Judging by every past election, they're going to vote overwhelmingly Democratic when it comes. But the question is, what about Jewish Republicans in the primaries? That 20, 25 percent of Jews who do lean Republican, will they vote for Trump? And it's easy to think, for the reasons that Nira said, that Jews won't vote for Trump because he doesn't seem to embrace what might be thought of as Jewish values, but the same thing could be said for white evangelical Protestants who lean overwhelmingly Republican, whose values would not seem to line up with those of someone who's been multiple times divorced, has made the kinds of statements he's made, and yet many evangelical Protestants do. So again, I would agree wholeheartedly with Jim. Jews are people too. They vote for a lot of different reasons. and. We don't have polling on this. There just isn't enough. Jew, you know, Jewish Republicans are such a tiny share of a tiny share of the population. They are a rounding error. They're well within the margin of error of any poll. So I don't know where they stand on Trump, but I think it's a great, a really, really interesting, interesting question. Share. In, 1992, really interesting share. in 1992, George H.W. Bush got 15% of the Jewish vote in New York. 
Al D'Amato, running right under him on the same Republican line, got 40% of the Jewish vote. If you remember the Jewish, the, I mean, sorry, the voting machines in New York, you physically have to make an effort to split your vote. Yeah. 25% of the Jews in New York split their vote. They voted Clinton and D'Amato. That's a quarter of a million votes. D'Amato won by 100,000. So those 100,000 includes a quarter of a million Jews who voted for D'Amato, but not for Bush. And when D'Amato claimed victory that night, he had Orthodox Jews standing on either side of him. Norman Rosenbaum, a, um, a, uh, um, an Australian citizen, and Dove Heikend, a right-wing Orthodox Jewish um, uh, state assemblyman. And they were standing like this, claiming victory um, over the, essentially those 250,000 votes that split. So it can make a difference in New York. Matt, I know you wanted to say something. And could I ask you a question, too? Um, which is this, that um, you know, reading Jeffrey Goldberg's long account of the Obama foreign policy, it was very striking how poisonous, in a way, the Middle East has become for the president, how frustrating, deeply frustrating. If you compare that with the Cairo speech, with the hopes that he came into office with and uh, his determination to change things and believe he could and now really the plague on all their houses I think would sum up the feeling that I, I got from much of that interview when it came to the Middle East. Um, do you think that's the inevitable fate at this point of the next president who comes in and will presumably want like every president before to change something but on the Israel-Palestine front? Is it just become an inevitable source of enormous frustration? Or are any of the things we're talking about tonight in any way suggestive of possibilities for change or something different emerging? Right. I mean, look, I, and I was going to raise this article. Obviously, I, mean, I think everyone should read it. I think it's an outstanding article. But I think it does reflect, sure, a certain uh, realism on the president's part regarding what the po possibilities are for change in the region, not only with respect to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but other, uh, you know, other conflicts that are consuming uh, the region now. And I think he, he I think correctly recognizes that there are, you know, realities on the ground there that need to change before progress is going to be made. But he's not, you know, saying that, you know, we're walking away from the region, obviously, we're not, or from you know our support for a two-state solution, our willingness to stand up and call for it, and to support both sides taking you know positive steps, confidence-building steps, you know, in the absence of direct face-to-face -face negotiations, to get there. I think uh, you know one point uh, when you asked me about leverage, and I, I thought about this when I was listening to Nira talking about this. You know, I think the the president and you know, comes across in that article because he is, you know, a realist, right? And so, you know, he doesn't, um, he's not really interested in feel-good diplomas, feel-good st steps that, you know, whether it's feel-good, you know, military strikes uh, to preserve American credibility, but I think it's also not feel-good pressure on the parties in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if they're just not going to come to the table and make an agreement, I, you know, and one of the, the big challenges I think that, that, you know, that I perceive is the, you know, the various disconnects in the debate right now because, you know, you have this uh, growing, you know, progressive voice that's represented, you know, so well here tonight, uh, you know, that has a voice in Washington, a pro-Israel voice in a pro-Israel town in a debate that is largely conducted uh, with everybody saying they're pro-Israel versus, you know, the college campus where, you know, J Street is on the right of the debate and there's a very different dynamic going on there versus Israel where, you know, BB is more towards the moderate end of where the debate is. So, and these various debates don't really map one on the other. And I think the absence of a voice in... Israel, a strong voice that, that is, you know, reflective of the views uh, that are, you know, em embodied by J Street and other progressive pro-Israel Jews is a, is a glaring and highly problematic yeah. absence that needs to be uh, grappled with. And we just can't 
walk in there if there isn't that voice and pressure you know, the Israeli government to do something for which there's not a strong consensus Well, the, the Labour Party still exists and other voices in Israel still and right. on in power right but now. You, but yeah. but I, I don't yeah. have a perception that that voice is as coalesced or strong. You know, most right. Israelis oppose the Iran deal, right? I mean, you had Israeli security officials and it was tremendous the work that J Street did to bring out those voices, but you still had a majority of of Israelis who were opposed to the deal. And I think it seems to me that, you know, a lot of Israelis are in a, in a different place. Uh, just, I mean, in, just, in terms just of... Just on that point, just to interject, sorry to yeah. get this, but to just build on Matt's point, you know, um, labor was not championing a peace deal. Like, that is a problem, right? That is a fundamental challenge in Israel that in the recent elections, they were silent. You know, and I get... And that's like they were looking at the electorate and made a response. And I think that is a deep challenge. I mean, I completely agree with Matt. The problem we seem to think in the United there is there is this kind of perspective that it's just like we're not trying hard enough. That We've, is not the reality well, of the situation on was, on this peace situation. Obviously Secretary Kerry and Hillary too, but Secretary Curry yep. could not have tried harder. <laughs> well, and I think it's, and we've, as, and you've all said this, you know, as Israel is moving this direction and we are moving this direction, you got to understand the American people aren't focusing on this at all. And as we get further and further away, we're not just moving left, we're moving out. We're isolating ourselves. Like, forget about the, you know, not talking about the Jewish community of this country, though they're not exactly focused on it either when you look at the polling. They're focused on the economy and jobs and health care and education. But we are at a, what could be a very dangerous place for, for America because if the voters and non-voters of this country don't want to touch it at all, the pressure on our elected officials who may used to have the ability to play because Americans weren't focused, now they're focused and they're focused away. That is, that is a growing challenge for J Street, for all of us who care about Israel and the Middle East, because the isolationism that is growing in this country rapidly. How is many, really how many of you up here still believe uh, in the possibility of a two-state outcome? Yeah. There we go. But would, you, but would you like to know what the figures are in Israel? Yeah, Sorry? What are the figures in Israel? So in Israel, it's less than half of Israeli Jews who believe that a way can be found, this is the exact polling question wording, that a way can be found for Israel and a Palestinian state to live together in peace. So we just completed, we just released a few weeks ago, a major poll we did, uh, took months in the field, face-to-face -face interviews, 5,600 Israelis. Um, Israeli public opinion is no more monolithic than American Jewish opinion. Um, and remember that there roughly as many Jews in Israel as there are in the United States. For about 40% of the world's Jewish population is in the United States and about 40% in Israel. And there is, as you do know, I'm sure all of you about Israeli society, there are vibrant voices for every political position <laughs> in Israel. Which is one of the reasons Fair. that I, I do think you should be a, we should be a little cautious in making blanket statements about what direction Israeli public opinion is moving in. It's very, it's, from a pollster's point of view, the, the evidence on it is, is, is mixed. But I will tell you this, again, it is less than half of Israeli Jews who think a way can be found for Israel and a Palestinian state to live together in peace. So that's not a question, that question is not, do is that, you support? Is that different from 10 years ago, 20 years ago? You know, I don't know, because the question wasn't asked that way. But the question isn't, do you support a two-state solution? It's not. It's do you think even hypothetically a way can be found that it, it could actually lead to, to that it could yeah. lead to real coexistence and peace and Israeli Jews have, have you know what we do we don't have 10 years of polling on it we have a few years of polling on it it's a little higher today than it was immediately after uh, the Gaza war um, uh, possibly um, the among Israeli Arabs confidence or optimism about the possibility of, of a two-state solution has plummeted. It's dropped 25 percentage points in two years. So it's now half of Israeli Arabs. But Israeli Arabs are slightly more optimistic than Israeli Jews, yeah. 
and American Jews are much more optimistic than Israeli Jews on this position. And American Jews are, in many ways, a little more, if you want to take the word, it means different things to different people, but a little more liberal on these issues. So I mentioned earlier a plurality of American Jews who think that settlements hurt Israel's security. In Israel, there's no majority position on this either. But in Israel, a plurality of Israeli Jews think settlements help Israel's own security. And only 17% say they hurt Israel's 17. security. 17. If I remember correctly. Jim, you wanted to say a quick thing? I, we're I we're running out of time. I can speak briefly a, a little bit about the trend line because uh, we've been involved in, in polling in Israel during the late 1990s. Uh, when uh, worked on Ehud Barak's campaign and the, it, we, you know, we were tracking this very carefully. And what you see is that when there is hope, when there is action, when there are things moving, the Israeli public rallies behind in a very strong way behind a peace agreement and they think it can happen. What's happening, what Alan's talking about right now is happening and it's, it's a reflection of what's going on in the debate and the lack of progress that's happening. But that Israeli public opinion is very volatile and it flips. And you ask, do we have a hope for two states? Absolutely. I mean, these things can, can flip. It can be because of events. It can become, be because of leadership. And the, it, leadership. Is, it is not static. Yeah. Mara, I noticed, I think that you were the only person who didn't, you didn't raise your hand when I asked if you think a two-state solution is still, two-state two state outcome is still possible. Could you, is that well, right? I guess I feel that, you know, not as a journalist, but as an American Jew, a two-state solution ha has to be possible because otherwise I would totally despair about the future of Israel as a Jewish democratic state. But, but what, what, after listening to Alan, it sounds like Israelis are almost giving up or despairing of that happening. So I was just feeling less hopeful, and that's why my hand didn't go up so Although I, could, so I, I would concur with Jim, you know, that events can change these things. Yeah. So we don't know where Israeli Jews or Israeli Arabs would be today if there were, you know, an active peace process going on. Or if there was leader, leaders who, who uh, believed in it. Right. And, if it, and when I say an active peace process going yeah. on, you know what I mean. I mean, yeah. if there were, there were actual talks going on and proposals and, you know, give, real give and take, I'm not saying that nothing's happening. Did you ask people about one state in your survey? No, we did not. And by the way, I misspoke. 42% of Israeli Jews say settlements help Israel's security. 30% say hurt. 30. 30. Oh, that's and 25% say they don't make a difference. 17 did so seem very low. Wrong. 17 uh, is my, uh, confusing that with the U.S. Well, we've uh, run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much. And thank you.